let's start with the, uh, the, the so-called children's videos. This is all about how to improve the radiation experience for patients and families. Tell us about the videos you make. What's their purpose? How are the young people involved? And how do you think it improves the experience for them, but also for their family? Sure, thanks, Julie. So, I mean, most simply, um, I guess there's a few aims of the project, but if we think about it, it's, you know, just to have a bit of fun on the day, first and foremost, to break away from, I guess, the general day of treatment. And I think it gives um, children anywhere from, they could be a superhero, they could be a princess, they could be a music star, or it could even be a basic documentary. But it um, provides an avenue for them to express themselves in a way you know, sometimes they can't, especially with the younger patients, they have a lot of fun with it. Sometimes they take on the persona, um, say of a superhero, and it could even you know, help them with the treatment you know, quite substantially. So um, yeah, we have a quite a broad, broad, broad range of, I guess, you know, videos we make and yeah. And you talk about fun. Is this work you're doing with these marvellous videos more than distraction? Do you see it as more than that when we speak in terms of improving the patient experience? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think it's different for every child and uh, family. So, you know, for some children, it's a way to remove the stigmatism associated with cancer treatment. So they can, you know, show that to their friends and family and sometimes, you know, show it in a fun and interactive way. Um, and it kind of breaks away that barrier, which is you know, really great. It also provides families, you know, generally to show them what's happening and sometimes a lasting memory, you know, of a time of, you know, of that treatment. So I think it certainly has a lot of benefits, you know, besides, you know, having some fun, you know, running around sometimes and creating some fun videos. So um, yeah, and provides an avenue for a lot of kids to tell their stories, a lot of the oldest uh, children as well. So yeah. And radiation therapy can be quite a daunting experience, not just for children, but anyone who's undergoing it, um, as you're well aware. So um, we were very mindful of that. I wanted to try and provide an experience that was I'm um, going to make it a little bit easier for our, for our children or our paediatric patients to get through. Um, so um, there was a, an idea that we put together with our, some colleagues up at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute um, and developed a, a research protocol on the back of a virtual reality um, experience that we developed, which takes the, the child through, not only the child, but also their, their families and their, their friends as well. It takes them through the radiotherapy experience prior to it actually occurring. So. For those of you who aren't aware, radiotherapy is a two-part process. It's the radiotherapy simulation, which quite often involves a mask getting made, which can, for anyone, can be quite a daunting experience. And then there's the radiotherapy, which is a series of um, treatments over anywhere up to sort of seven weeks um, of, of radiation. Um, so the virtual reality experience is filmed um, through the eyes of a child. Um, so we can, the child puts the goggles on, they can actually watch the child go through the radiation therapy. We've also filmed it so that it can be visualise as if the child is actually having the treatment themselves or having the mask made themselves so that when they actually go ahead and have the procedure done it is hoped that they'll have a better understanding of what's going to happen in the hope that then it would then lead to um, reduced anxiety and improved health literacy about what's going to happen um, so that they're a little bit more at ease going into their treatment. Is part of the purpose to reduce the need for sedation? Yeah definitely that, that was one of the things we were looking at doing obviously younger children find it more anxiety um, provoking, I guess, this procedure. So that was very much part of the initial, um, I guess, brief for this project to try and reduce that need. And it is something that we've been looking at as part of our, our research project as well, to try and you know, negate the need for, the, for general anaesthesia as part of their, their treatment. Look, let's turn now to the work you've been doing in relation to PEG tubes. And, and just for the uninitiated, could you explain what they are and what was the purpose of your research and again, lessons to improve the experience for the patient and their family. Sure, so a PEG tube is a, um, a, a tube that's put in um, to the patient to help them get through and manage their nutrition throughout their radiotherapy. Um, and in particular for head and neck cancer patients where the side effects of the radiation can be quite um, debilitating and can really um, impact your ability to, to maintain your usual nutritional intake. So a PEG tube enables you to supplement that um, through um, enteral needs or through straight directly into the stomach without the need to swallow, um, without the need to um, I guess eat as we usually would and we're, we're so used to doing. Because it become, can become quite challenging um, during the course of radiation as those side effects continue to build. Um, but obviously it's a very invasive procedure having that PEG tube put in. Um, so we wanted to do, well, the, I guess the basis of my PhD was 
um, trying to predict which patients are going to need them to justify having the PEG tube inserted. So that we weren't giving it to everyone um, unnecessarily, but also making sure we were giving it to the most suitable patients throughout the, um, to manage them best through their treatment. So we looked at a whole series of variables in um, the patients and also the type of treatment we were giving them to try and um, tease out which were the key predictors um, to enable them to, I guess, to, us to justify giving them um, a peg tube. So not only was it helping us in our decision making, but also enabled us to better educate the patients and making that consent process a lot more transparent uh, in that decision um, making. So it was like a, what we called it was a risk stratification model. So if you were to, um, this is your treatment, this is what we're going to be doing. The risk of you requiring a peg tube for an extended period of time is X percent. Um, so we recommend you should get one or and at least enables the patient then if they choose not to, they know that the onus is maybe more on them to be able to maintain their, their nutritional intake. So they, they've got a better idea before signing up, I guess, as to maybe what to expect. And, and what are the uh, three or four key risk factors that it predict that a person may well need to put a peg into their stomach and have food dripped through it uh, right from the beginning of their radiation? So for sure, so we did um, a lot of work looking at a lot of clinical predictive factors. So things that we know before they actually start their radiation therapy and the two things that we found out um, that were really critical in predicting a, a, a extensive use of a peg tube, um, not only during their radiation, but also beyond their treatment was the size of the tumour. So we call that the T stage. So we found that tumours that had a T stage of T3 or T4, so the larger tumours, where um, those patients were more likely to require a, a peg tube for a long period of time. And also patients that have at a certain level of um, disease in their neck nodes as well, which sometimes where the disease can spread to and requires high doses of radiation. So we found that the, the level two neck nodes were also pertinent. So um, we looked at different combinations of those two factors and found that patients that had both of those were going to feed or need a feeding tube for the longest. Those who had either or of those or one of those, um, they were likely to still feed for a significant amount of time justifying the need for a peg tube. And we found that those patients who had neither of those, those facets were actually best, um, they wouldn't require a peg tube for as long enough to justify having one inserted. So, One lesson I'm hearing is that, uh, that uh, your work enables patients to be better informed and therefore involved in a commitment uh, to the peg as being necessary. Just before I leave the peg, what about the family? You know, that reminder that radiation is an outpatient treatment predominantly and uh, families can be very involved in maintaining the peg tube site, in getting the liquid food down the tube, in cleaning the tube. You know, there's a that, that a lot of that care is happening at home, isn't it? So, what have you learnt for the family? Oh, definitely. I think I can speak from my own personal experience. My father actually, not due to a cancer diagnosis, but actually uses a peg tube and has for a number of years now. So I really understand the burden of what maintaining a peg tube is in terms of, you know, can, as you said, infection control, maintaining the regularity of the peg feeding so that the actual um, nutritional um, uptake is maintained throughout the course of a day. So I, I've seen firsthand and been involved in it myself on a, on a regular basis to know that um, the family plays a critical role. So I think it's really important to also educate not just the patient but also the family um, in particular as they'll play a significant role. And that could be just one immediate family member, it could be multiple family members. So I think the more we educate, not only the patient but also the families, um, the more likely the patient's going to get through their treatment experience um, in a far greater, um, with a far greater success and a, I think a far greater compliance to what we're asking them to, to do for their, for their own best interest, obviously. And as you walk into the bunker, the, the big room that where you have your radiation treatment, is it decorated in any way or, or are there any objects there that are particularly designed to help the children? Yeah, definitely. We have a dedicated bunker here at Peter McCallum which is dedicated to our paediatric patients. So it does have some decorations on the wall. Um, we also have a, a treasure chest in the corner which um, children can take sort of little gifts um, each time they finish their treatment as well. Um, again, to try and make it as... I guess welcoming as possible um, to make them feel, you know, safe coming into our environment and knowing that it's, it's I guess it's tailored to them. So I think we're fortunate. Our building's only is it nearly four years old now. I think so. We had that specifically made for that purpose, um, and also our waiting area as well also has a paediatric specific waiting room. Also, it has some children's toys. It has a TV set up. Um, it's separate, obviously, to the adult waiting room as well, which I think serves a dual purpose. It's it's good for the children because it's a dedicated space for them. But we found a lot of our adult patients were also finding it quite challenging to see children um, in this environment. Also, so it also separates them also. So it's got toys. It's got little couches games, it's where the music therapy occurs. Again, it's where siblings can also be 
whilst their, their brother or sister is off having treatment. So um, it's a really welcoming space for, for the whole family. Well, well, Nigel Anderson, fantastic to talk to you. Thanks, Julie. Pleasure. So the idea came during lockdown and I wanted to make the bunker and the treatment room a bit more interactive. Um, I want it to be wanted it to be a bit more friendly and um, I guess less daunting and for children particularly coming in. So we thought why not bring the outside in? <laughs> Uh, Bianca from Centre for Projection Arts said, look, we might be able to do something here. I uh, told him the idea of, uh, or the goal of what we wanted to create, you know, I guess going around the bunker, make it interactive, and um, we started from there. And the actual process to get all this done has been, yeah, exactly, or has been six months in that, in that sense. So a lot of hours have gone into, I guess, creating the, this first animation. So the feedback so far has been really good. Uh, well, with our, especially with our paediatric patients, I think it's been really great to see them interact with the art directly. Uh, trying to, I guess, you know, chase the birds or catch the snowflakes. So, um, and just seeing, you know, smiles on the face and making, you know, that treatment room or that bunker space, uh, you know, less fearful, less daunting for them has been, you know, fantastic. And that's what it's all about.